recent news articles have identified the possibility that there is fraud going on with Obamacare with health insurance brokers. And here to talk with us about that is Jay O, author of Maximize Your Medicare. Jay, welcome. Thanks for having me, Bob. It's a pleasure. So uh, where to begin? Uh, what is going on with this fraud with respect to Obamacare or ACA health insurance? I, I myself was stunned, Bob, from a recent report by KFF where it was reported that plans have been changed for people, people who are enrolled in, let's just call it health insurance plan one, and didn't know that they were being changed until they, till some other date in the future, unknowingly by an agent. And this I found almost shocking to be candid with you that what happens is you're not supposed to have this happen unintentionally, obviously. This would represent wrongdoing by a financial licensed professional. For example, my firm, we have access, we do have permissions through the Affordable Care Act and the marketplace that said there are steps that people can take to find out and then also they're very likely to be exceptions granted to allow people to switch back. So in, in terms of how this fraud has impacted consumers, uh, uh, is it uh, obviously it's for the, the worst, but how bad is it? Well, it can be pretty shocking because of the fact that incredibly we've talked about Medicare, but on the ASA, it's even more fragmented, which is that for example, in a particular location, there can easily be over 100 ACA compliant plans in a particular zip code. That is very common. So what would happen is if you filed a claim, you went to a doctor, you received and you needed an x-ray, for example, and the charges were not what you expected, meaning that you thought your deductible was $2,500, let's just say, and you believe that you've met it and you wouldn't necessarily know until you actually looked at your month, your summary of benefits, as well as your summary from the insurance carrier, where they should be reporting to you precisely how much you were charged, how much the carrier paid and your responsibility. And Strangely enough, for example, if you're not a frequent user of healthcare services, you wouldn't necessarily even know this. So as a result, it's important to, of course, pay attention to your bills, meaning that, for example, if you have monthly deduction for your premium payments, that you'll want to keep an eye out on it to make sure they're nothing abnormal. And in the case that you do need to file a claim, you will be receiving a bill, in which case th these charges would be detailed and to check on it and to call the carrier immediately if you find some, something that seems out of order. Yeah. So it seems like those are great ways to detect and perhaps prevent the fraud from occurring after the, you know, maybe before and after the fact. It seems odd to me that no one would um, receive a notice of change if they insurance policy was changed from plan A to plan B. It's an excellent thought. And the reality is that you do receive a piece of paper to say, this is your plan for the coming year. That is true. Whether or not everyday people actually take the time to read those letters is another topic. <laughs> uh, certainly that would be advisable. Of course, the main thing, the stunning thing is to report, you know, and share with your audience, the fact that this type of wrongdoing, that there's even a pathway to it. That's what I found most shocking, to be candid with you, that unbeknownst to the policy owner, that their plan may have been changed by their agent of record. There are corrective matters here. In other words, like I said, if you had a problem, we've I've actually professionally encountered this with one of our clients, that they had been changed without the client knowing and we were able to rectify the situation i would expect fully expect that exception to be granted by the cms and then from there 
the carriers would follow suit. I, I suppose the answer to this is obvious, but uh, to what end is this fraud being committed by health insurance brokers? Is it to earn more commissions or earn twice as many commissions or what's what's the what's the MO? It's hard to tell, to be candid with you, Bob, uh, because the way that agents are compensated under the Affordable Care Act is usually, usually just simply a flat rate per member. So it doesn't really benefit someone to really switch. But that said, I'm not privy to every last detail. Could there be extra bonuses involved, for example? Are there other motivations that a particular producer may have, meaning that they meet some quota or some target or something like that? That is all entirely possible. I, I candidly, we don't engage in that type of activity because of the fact that we're not motivated to hit a particular number. So as a result, I wouldn't know exactly. All I know is I was shocked that the technology does exist where they're using these third-party platforms to connect directly to the marketplace to have this type of thing occur. So obviously we mentioned buyer beware as sort of step one in detecting and preventing fraud. Are federal and state regulators getting involved in sort of trying to identify uh, this when it happens or before it happens? In theory, for example, when someone comes to our portal, just to give you an example, they, someone can come to gh2benefits.com, they can find a quote where they can see whether or not they qualify for lower premiums, lower deductible out-of-pocket maximums under the ACA. From that point, however, we would have to have collected a consent form. And this is a fairly new development, hopefully. And, and I say that, you know, carefully, which is that in theory, it is, it is the fact that if you were to switch plans, that you would have to be granting this type of consent. Uh, so I guess the other obvious question is, I'm a consumer and I want to make sure I'm dealing with a legitimate, honest health insurance broker who will do right by me and not do wrong by me by switching me out of a policy that I wasn't expecting to be switched out of. What do you recommend to the to the end user, the consumer who is uh, at wit's end because you know they're they're out they're they're not in their they're not in their domain, right? They're not in their comfort zone for sure. I I've made many comments like about this specific topic when it comes to Medicare as well as the Affordable Care Act. If someone is under suspicion, if you have any doubt whatsoever, you simply ask the question, what is your NPN? And that is the national producer number. There is a federal database. There's one number per person. Uh, everyone has it. Every licensed professional will have a unique one. And from there, you can kind of stop cold the unsolicited phone call, for example or whatever communication, because I tell persons, if they're not willing to share their number with you immediately, that is kind of almost an immediate red flag for me. To give you an idea, every outgoing email that comes from our office has my NPN on it in the footer. So literally it is something that someone cannot run away from as a licensed person and then that person must also be licensed in the state and with the carrier in order to be your agent of record. So I know FINRA and the SEC have something called broker check, where if you wanted to look at your stockbroker and see if there were past evidence of wrongdoing, uh, you could do that. Um, is there anything similar to that at the state or federal level for uh, health insurance brokers? Not really, not in the same centralized manner meaning that every state insurance is governed at the state level ultimately. And so as a result, you would have to be your specific state. There, that said, they would be able to tell you whether or not, for example, if that person were an in-state producer or a non-resident producer. For example, I'm here in Ann Arbor. That said, we've got many clients in Austin. 
they can easily in Texas look up my name, the number, I will have a Texas non-resident license number. And there they could certainly feel free to see, to make sure about possible complaints or something like that, any controversies in that state. Uh, this is such a fascinating topic, Jay. I'm not even sure we've exhausted each and every question, but uh, uh, feel free to amplify or 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 just sort of uh, reemphasize what we've talked about. Sure. And I think that it kind of, the last point I would leave is that I don't think, and it's my opinion, that this is, you know, the majority of cases. I think this is a, quite exceptional. That said, there is that aspect, which is that the rules are really about how a, a financial professional does their job. And then there's another layer, which is to me, the primary should be the primary focus of consumers is to make sure that the producer is doing what the job is, that they are communicating correctly with you so that they, they are the, doing the job as assigned, meaning You've got a certain list of healthcare providers that you favor and have been with for decades. Make sure that they accept the plan, et cetera. Those are the what they're doing, what job they're actually doing. And for me, I would tell most consumers to focus on that. And then also just recognize the fact there can be wrongdoing and the world is competitive. They can find other providers who will do the, both the job what you want them to do and how you want them to do it. Yeah. So if I could editorialize for a second, I'm always of the opinion that the good health insurance professionals, the good financial advisors, uh, the good police officers, whatever the case may be, should be out there trying to stamp out the, the bad ones so that not everyone gets painted with the same broad brush stroke. And uh, to the degree to which we can help people identify the good from the less good, uh, I think it's all for the better. So I want to thank you, Jay, for sharing everything today about this topic. Absolutely, Bob. My privilege.